Your response? Pick it up. Right. It's important. Um, the next slide is uh, again by Stoll. And it's not very clear, but it's the best I've got. Um, this is Japan again. Here. And you can see that um, most of the cesium fell on the sea on the Pacific Ocean. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm trying a, a, a bit of a comparison between Fukushima and, and uh, Chernobyl because it's by comparisons that you learn. You get an idea of what, where we are, get a handle on it. If you compare the two, uh, the fallout from Chernobyl was over a much larger area in terms of high concentrations. Uh, Chernobyl was uh, over land, not in the sea. Whereas in, in Fukushima, about 80% of the, certainly the cesium fallout was over the sea rather than land, only 20% over land. However, in Japan, the population densities were much higher than they were in Ukraine and uh, Belarus and, uh, and the Soviet Union. At Chernobyl also, we think that the, uh, the source terms were larger. I'll come to that in a minute. So it gives you an idea of uh, the differences and similarities between the two. This is a slide which most Ameri North Americans are not really aware, so I'm going to let you have a look at it. This is the depositions of cesium throughout Europe. In essence, ladies and gentlemen, Europe was clobbered. 60% uh, of the fallout from Chernobyl fell on Western Europe. The highest concentrations were in Belarus, Ukraine, and Russia, but the actual amounts were spread throughout the whole of um, Western Europe. There's one slightly funny aspect in that, and that is if you look at France here, La Belle France, the, German gov the French government announced that the, um, that the uh, Chernobyl fallout couldn't possibly land in France. <laughs> 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 it was a, the trouble, we can laugh at it now, but at the time they took it seriously, I kid you not. And uh, um, when this data came out, they were, um, as a, uh, the result was that a number of cabinet ministers had to resign. I kid you not. <laughs> and another thing is that you know, one of the, for those people who are uh, students of irony, so to speak, is if you look at the UK, um, the highest doses that fell out from the plume fell on Sellafield. <laughs> it was quite, quite funny. Um, but just going on a little bit, I'm going to constantly look now at this, at this area here in the next slide. This is it here. And this is, this is Chernobyl. And you can see the, the concentrations uh, which fell. Um, these are high concentrations. Uh, an immediate area. Now, the next slide is going to be a bit of a shocker, um, but I hope you'll take it on the chin. Um, I've superimposed here Fukushima on top of the map that I showed you previously. It's the same scale, and the colors are roughly, the, uh, again, to the same scale. So it gives you an idea of the respective sizes of the fallouts. Now, you're not just to take away from that that uh, Fukushima is not important. Of course it is. It's very serious indeed. It's just that Chernobyl was a catastrophe. And I use the word advisedly. Um, Alexei used the word, and I totally agree. It was a, and is a catastrophe for the rest of Europe. And Japan's got its own one now. Um, I'm not minimizing Japan at all. Fukushima at all. It's just that in the scale of things, oh, geez, Chernobyl was, was and is very bad. And I'm going to talk now a little bit about um, the source term. It's quite, it's quite debatable. The most important nuclides are cesium um, from uh, Fukushima. There's quite a bit of debate. Yesterday, Ken Busler showed there was a number of estimates. Um, the Japanese ones are all about 10 petabecquerels. 
instead of 36 from Fukushima. Uh, for, I hope you don't mind my using these words. Petty Becquerel is basically 15 zeros after, uh, after one. A humongous, amount, a humongous amount of radioactivity. Um, so that's, uh, it's a quadrillion uh, disintegrations per second. <laughs> it's pretty large. But anyway, um, if you look at the two cesium uh, numbers here, they're three and a half times what all the, the other Jap official Japanese uh, estimates were. But I don't believe the Japanese official estimates. I don't trust them one inch. So I tend to prefer the estimates by Stoll and, and his colleagues in Norway. Now, you may say, well, why do you believe, and that's from the Norwegian Protection, Radiation Protection Agency, why do you believe them? Well, Norway doesn't have any nuclear power stations. Okay, very important. And also, if you look at the iodine, uh, Stoll didn't measure iodine, unfortunately. And uh, so I had to go for another data source, and I used the Austrian uh, Environment Protection Agency data. Why did I use Austria? There's no nuclear power station in Austria. One of the things I've learned, I've been in this area for a long time, and one of the areas, one of the things I've found out, uh, any country that's got nuclear power in it, the information data sources are contaminated. A couple of points also from this slide is that you'll see that, uh, that the um, um, radioactive novel gas xenon 133, half-life of about five days, um, um, actually more was emitted from Fukushima than Chernobyl, mainly because there was three reactors that uh, went up, uh, whereas at Chernobyl there was one. Um, these data show very roughly that um, what I had shown earlier, that, that the effect from Fukushima was about an order of magnitude lower than the effect from, from uh, Chernobyl. Now, um, this is an interesting slide, which I said to you that Chernobyl was really, really bad. Hey, guess what was worse? Well, you look at it for a second. The important is the x-axis which gives you the time, yeah. the year is 1960, oh, 55, 60, 65. Guess what happened then? You got it. It was the atmospheric bomb tests. And you can see that it put out a huge amount of cesium into the atmosphere. Um, in 1986, yeah. um, you had Chernobyl, which was short, sharp and sweet, 10 days followed by, as you can see, the body burden of cesium there. And uh, this is uh, millibecquerels per, uh, per square, or cubic meter or so in, in the air. Um, the trouble is that not many people really study the effects of the atomic bomb tests, but they are serious. Going on. Um, in February... 28th this year, um, I think it was time uh, uh, to, to um, sort of negate the anniversary um, meetings and uh, conferences uh, for the second anniversary of Fukushima. They rushed the report out. In fact, there's a number of typos in it. I don't know if you've seen it. Um, anyway, the WHO report um, said that... Um, there was little bits of uh, little increases in breast cancer and leukemia amongst uh, people who were um, near Fukushima, but a big increase in women um, of thyroid cancer risks. Um, that's probably the case. However, I, 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 I'm, I think that breast cancer and leukemia incidences actually may be bigger than this. Again, WHO report was very vague. It said risk for protected be, uh, predicted to be low, no discernible increase outside of Japan, which is nonsense. And uh, a third of emergency workers have increased risks. Wow. So what? 
I mean, the thing is that you should try and get numbers to these, and, and they haven't done it. Anyway, having put down <laughs> the WHO report, I'm going to talk a little bit about what we can expect to happen at Fukushima, unfortunately, using Chernobyl as a guide. Um, an initial nine-month period after March the 11th, 2011, we can expect to see teratogenic effects, in other words, effects from exposures in utero to uh, embryos and fetuses. And they're listed there. After two years, um, we expect to see leukemias increasing yeah. in adults, but they are really hard to pick up because um, leukemia is a relatively rare disease. After four years, we expect to see increases in thyroid cancers coming along. And after 10 years, solid cancers and various other effects, particularly cardiovascular effects. That's what we expect to see in that timeline. Now, we're already two years past. So I've said here, within the first nine months, are there any effects? Well, yes, there are. And it's due to a gentleman called Dr. Alfred Kerblein, uh, who lives in Nuremberg, that um, we owe a great deal of thanks because he's dug up the data and, he, and this is what he's found. He found an infant, a peak in infant mortality about six weeks after the uh, uh, February, sorry, March the 11th, 2011. And um, I'd like to show this before, but we can, this peak here um, is uh, quite significant. It shows that... Um, I'll just go on to the next slide. It shows a threefold increase in infant mortality rate, um, as, uh, um, which is statistically significant. Instead of the, the observed rate was about nine per thousand, and the expected was about three, so a threefold increase. We're not absolutely sure what's going on here, but um, basically these infant deaths are. Uh, are an anomaly, uh, we see them, and uh, they've happened elsewhere. Now, there's a second event, uh, and that is, in fact, I should say, uh, a decline in live birth numbers. And this happens nine months after March the 11th. It's, uh, this is observable not only in uh, Fukushima Prefecture, but also in the whole of Japan. In Fukushima, um, there was a reduction in the birth of the live birth numbers of 15%, and in all of Japan, about 5%. These are statistically significant. This is, these are big enough numbers for us to know there's something going on here. Now, the next slide is I'm going to be showing you is the standardized residuals. And we've looked at the data and turned it so that on its side so you can actually see it, of monthly data for Fukushima Prefecture, and you can see the, uh, the number of live births nine months later falls off a cliff here. 